Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You all, please be seated. I, thank you. Thank you very much, Governor, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Cherry, thank you, and former Congressman Joe Schwartz, thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Congressman Sandy Levin, who's out in the audience, and Barbara Levin, thank you both of you for coming uh, to represent the Levin family and your solid support for this. I want to thank uh, my friend Linda Nelson, all the others who raised money, but I especially have to thank Alfred Taubman, who is responsible for my being here today. He came to have lunch with me in my office in Harlem a couple of weeks ago, and I had uh, read his autobiography. I thought he was a fascinating fellow, and I had all these questions I was going to ask, and this is all he wanted to talk about. And uh, I like that. Because when you reach a certain age and your ambition's been slaked, you ought to spend the rest of your life trying to make sure nobody dies before their time that you can stop and that everyone who's alive has a chance to live up to the fullest of their God-given ability. So I thank you. And uh, I can't say enough about Laura. You know, I don't think many, there's anything else for the rest of us to say. Uh, after she spoke, I felt, as I did once when I was the last speaker on a long program and everybody really wanted to go home and my introducer said, well, we could stop here and have had a very nice evening. He didn't mean the way it came out. <laughs> but what it sounded like was everything that needs to be said has been said, but not everyone has said it, so I'm going to let Bill Clinton say something. <laughs> I do want to say a few things because of the peculiar role that I was privileged to play at the beginning of what I never would imagine would become a controversy like this. And I think I'd like to say too that I'm here not just for myself but for my senator and my wife who has worked very, very hard on this issue for a long time. But today, all the public talk is about the economy and what little is left goes into this national campaign. And I guess it's easy to forget about what the decisions citizens make are really all about, which are the lives and futures of people like Laura and her family and the countless millions of others. You've already heard the argument and seeing that this is not about a fight between Republicans and Democrats or left and right, and certainly not about pro-life or pro-choice. I have a very close friend who is a devout doctor, Catholic, pro-life, and when he found out I was coming here today, he said, good for you. I don't know how anybody could be against this. This is the pro-life position. And The fact is, when this ban was adopted decades ago, we didn't know then what we know now. I had the great honor of being president and putting a lot of your tax money into the historic effort to sequence the human genome, to understand the basic building structure of human life. And finally, we finished in 2000. A public and private sector effort, a big international effort, and once that happened, we had to figure out, well, what next? Because everybody knew that once the genome was sequenced, all the real work would come in trying to figure out where the variations were that made people more likely to develop this or that or the other condition. And if you once found that out, and for example, we now know the major genetic variances that make baby girls highly likely to develop breast cancer, at an earlier stage in life than would normally occur. And preventive steps can be taken. Someday there will be no more mastectomies because of this. But we had to fund the research to figure out the practical applications and then figure out what to do about it. 
So the stem cell issue was rising when it became obvious in my second term that we might actually complete this sequencing. And in 1999, a, a group in my administration I had appointed to look at the ethical implications of this came back with a recommendation that said simply that embryonic stem cell research was the most fruitful line of inquiry to deal with all these things that Laura mentioned, that all of you know, and that the research ought to be able to be done on any embryos that were stored to deal with infertility challenges but would never be used, that is, could never be fertilized and that otherwise can lawfully simply be thrown away. Michigan is one of, as you know, just a handful of states that has the most restrictive laws claiming apparently that the pro-life position is not to allow the research to proceed, but it's perfectly fine to throw all these embryos away. And I have spent a lot of my life on these problems now. In my current life, uh, I do a rather large project with the American Heart Association dealing with the problems of childhood obesity and the fact that we now have children developing type 2 diabetes. Now, we know we can avoid type 2 diabetes with different diet and lifestyles, but a lot of people have it and will die earlier because of it, and this research is helpful. It is absolutely essential for type 1 diabetes. There's not a person here who doesn't know somebody who could be benefited by this work. Not a person. I lost an aunt and an uncle to Alzheimer's. And I'm really proud that Hillary's on the Alzheimer's caucus in the Senate because of that. My former chief of staff, now the president of the University of North Carolina, one of the best friends I ever had, has two of his three children with type 1 diabetes. I think that's why the third became a doctor. He lost a sister and a father to ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. I just lost one of my law school classmates who was my ambassador to Chile to ALS. The person in the whole world who's lived the longest with it, the great British, British physicist Stephen Hawking, is a very good friend of mine and I never see him, never, that I don't think how many brains have been lost who were not fortunate enough to be able to live as long as he did under the circumstances under which he's lived. Not just to ALS or to muscular dystrophy or to various kinds of cancers or heart attacks or strokes or all the other things. And when I was looking at Laura, I was thinking about Christopher Reeve, who became close to me when he was no longer able to play Superman because his spine was broken, but became a Superman to me because he was like her. And he told me, and, and I'll never forget, you know, when he brought me in, and I was president, I was supposed to know these things, the miserable state of biomedical research in the spinal injury area in every area of our budget except in the veterans medical system because so many soldiers were afflicted by it. And in my last year as president, a laboratory animal had a nerve transplant from the legs to the spine after its spine had been cracked and experienced movement in its lower limbs. It's the first time anybody had ever achieved it, even in the lab. Stem cell research will tell us how to give Laura a chance to walk again. And then we'll all be her cheerleaders. Uh, now, 